should suggest that. Oh. No, no, no. I thought the. <laughs>
We're getting ready to start. If you want to start coming into the room, take your seats. What do you want? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to move. Um, we'll probably have you have to have you walk over here. Okay, so we're going to have this out here for the audience. We just finished our council meeting and this will be much less formal than a council meeting. We appreciate you being here tonight. This is an important issue for our city right now and um, we will have all of our council members here. Mr. Harding just, um, no, you're here. <laughs> Sorry, you, I, I, I catch you. Mr. Hand Handley is just is just stepped out for a second. He'll be here in just one second, but he, uh, we're, yes, he's getting ready. Let's just go. Um, what we'll do, we'll just let's start with Dave, and you can introduce. Uh, these are the council members. will be up front here. Gary Winterton. And I'm sure you know all of us at some point here. And George Handley will be here in just one second. Um, we had an opening prayer with our council meeting, and so we're going to assume that that continues on. And we will begin with the presentation by, let me just explain how we're going to go here. We'll start with a presentation from um, Cliff Strachan, on how we got to where we're at today. Then we will have a, what do you, the, the, the four part, right? We'll have Bill Fillmore will come and speak for the bond. Diane Christensen will then speak against the bond. And we will also, from there, we will go with um, open questions. And we're just gonna try to run it smooth, as smoothly as we can, answer as many questions as we, as we can. Um, you can direct it to a specific council member or to the council. We have police and fire chiefs are here to answer any questions. Mayor's here. She's allowed us to run this meeting and it's our meeting, I guess, and so we're gonna be running this as a council. And Mr. Parker has been involved in this from, for many, many years, and he's here available for, to answer questions also. So we'll go to that point, Mr. Strachan. Oh, before we do, I'm gonna ask Mr. Jones to talk about legalities of this meeting. Hi, my name is Brian Jones. I'm the attorney for the council, and I just wanted to, um, at Mr. at Chair, Winterton's urging, I just wanted to make a comment about what the purpose of this meeting is. I just wanted to make clear so that everyone's uh, clear from the beginning about the intent that this is not a campaign event. This is not designed as a please vote for the bond event. Instead, this is an informational meeting for the, for the citizens. Now, having said that, it's no secret that the members of the city council and the mayor are for the bond. The, the mayor proposed putting the bond on, on the ballot and, uh, and the administration worked toward that end and the city council voted unanimously to put the bond on the ballot and the city council has unanimously approved a statement that went out to the public indicating why they are in favor of the bond and, and the reasons that they support the bond. So, so that's not a secret and, and it's not our intent to try to hide the fact that the administration and the city council are in, fa in fact in favor of the bond but the purpose of this meeting is to share factual information and to allow members of the public to make comments for and against. So. Thank you, Cliff. One second. Uh, we have Mr. Blackman here and also John Borgett. Can, he's in charge of facilities and John Borgett can answer any financial questions that we might have as this comes forward. So think about your questions and hopefully we have the expertise here to answer, answer those questions. Cliff. 
Thank you. Might add that uh, Peter Moyes is here. He's been uh, behind the scenes working on our, our needs assessment, our space and needs and, and uh, costs and all those kinds of things. Um, it's my purpose now just to share with you an overview of the police, fire and city facilities bond, what it does and what happens if it passes or what happens if it fails. And I'll tell you a little how we got there. Uh, Brian gave you a little bit of the political um, uh, works behind it in terms of how it came to a vote. So what the bond is, it's a $69 million general obligation bond to be repaid over 20 years from a property tax levy. It is intended to replace Fire Station 2 and the police, fire station, emergency dispatch and city offices uh, that are currently housed within the city center complex. Why is it, or why is it, why it is? The city leaders, at the urging of the mayor, who's a city leader, uh, but um, the city long ago identified a number of physical needs uh, pertaining to the fire station number two, the police station, fire station number one, uh, the emergency dispatch, and uh, overall the city offices that are housed in these buildings here. Um, and they're faced with a, cho a choice of uh, replacing or upgrading, and over time they've evaluated these. Let me tell you how it is. Seismic safety. In 1992, a seismic vulnerability and water tightness assessment identified major seismic structural deficiencies. It also addressed issues of water tightness in the building, water leakage and things, but um, for lack of space, I didn't mention there. The, our big concern with the seismic is that this building, these buildings would not survive if we had a moderate earthquake within about 20 miles of the city. And for those who are, don't think that's a big deal, imagine how we would try to respond in a city if, if we didn't have police fire operating out here, if we didn't have our information systems being able to track them. Um, and uh, we certainly wouldn't be able to respond to schools in the way we'd want to or to, to our residents. The city center and the Covey Center were not designed, constructed, or subsequently upgraded to address the seismic and wind structural standards now required for buildings classified as essential services buildings. That was uh, 2012 from Police Department Facility Evaluation. Those standards have gone up since the time the build, they didn't even exist in 1972. Um, by the time uh, 1992 came along, uh, we didn't meet those standards and the standards have gotten harder and, and, and higher since then. Space needs. We have, uh, many of you have had an opportunity to tour the buildings. We have inadequate space for our police and fire. And, uh, and we've been told that we need about 78,000 square feet for the headquarters uh, that are currently in these buildings. The entire building right now is about 64,000 square feet. Another 80,000 square feet for city functions by 2040. And you see on the overhead there, you can see the, the reports that those came from. The other is that this building now is 46 years old. It was built in 1972. And uh, six years ago, the police department facility evaluation, uh, which is commonly known, Wayne, by a space needs analysis that we've done. We commonly refer to it as that. It stated, quote, the building demonstrates the extreme wear and tear consistent with a building of its age. And then a couple paragraphs later add to it, many parts of it are now dysfunctional and simply worn out. So how do we get here? One of the things that people have said that, um, is that we've rushed this. We haven't rushed this. 1992, we had an assessment to identify problems. 2012, we had an assessment that identified issues. 2013, we started looking at the space needs. 2014, the city engaged, and I only put two items here, but the city engaged in a number of community efforts to identify what to do with this city center block. So placemaker study did a, a, a review of what the city center block could be. And then the city entertained six proposals, narrowed it down to three, and then ultimately decided that they couldn't build them at that time, realizing that bonding was a necessity, um, op, trying to do it as by lease or paid as you go options just wasn't going to work for the city. Move along to 2016 uh, under Mayor Curtis, a building committee was established with city employees 
from uh, different departments, and we collectively looked at a lot of different options and alternatives and, and opportunities through the city, um, <clears throat> and eliminated some and considered some and tried to assess really what was needed in terms of, of, of the city's uh, potential uh, for these things. In 2016, we also had a city center minor structural condition assessment, which reiterated and found some of the same things we've already expressed. In the meantime, 2017 comes along, the city's still looking at opportunities. We, we, we vastly explored the ancestry building option in North Provo, found it to be inadequate for our needs. We looked around the city from all the way from East Bay to the mall to the north end and, and everywhere in the downtown we could think of. We tried to find sites that we thought would work. We tried to find empty buildings or opportunities that could happen. Um, and when we came back to it, it we came down eventually in 27, 2018. Um, we were still working on it. And Brixton approached the, the city with a mall option. So we looked at that. Uh, we also considered what, whether we could just stay in this same building and retrofit it and build new police fire uh, across the parking lot. Um, we went to Open City Hall. We consulted with members of the public. We heard from you in your emails. And um, what we found was that people, the majority, if not, uh, I won't say a vast majority, but the majority of people that we heard from basically preferred the downtown option over the other options. So when council considered all those things, they made the decision back in August that they were gonna put it on a, on, a, on a bond question for you to, to consider, and they chose the city center option, and they chose it for a number of reasons, and the part of it you'll, you'll hear about uh, over the, 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 the course of the campaign that's going on, but really what it came down to was they felt that it was uh, a good value for the downtown. The downtown uh, seems to be the right place to go. It seems to be where the residents wanted it. Uh, there were some concerns about the mall option. Uh, what we did find is retrofit and upgrade this facility was uh, almost a non-starter. Very, very few people thought that that was a good idea. Um, just through three examples from the Daily Herald, 2013, 2014, 2017, you could add 2018, you could add uh, earlier dates than that. These are just times when the Daily Herald noted that, this, that the council was reaching out into the community to get input. Next slide. Okay, so where is it? On the right side, you'll see a Canyon Road. If you think about Canyon Road, Canyon Road kind of does this, it goes north and then it jags over and, and moves north again. And this is on the, on the curve. And the Canyon Road site is, that's the existing fire station now. And I don't know which side you were building on it, but if you were to build a new fire station, it's basically on the same property. Is that an understanding? Okay. As for the city center, on the left side, we oriented the, uh, the map there so you could see how it, how it pictures. If you look up here, this is, although it looks like new skin blue, this was just a representation of the space needs, and we had an earlier version of this was all colored, and it said, you know, this is police, this is fire, this is uh, city offices, et cetera. Um, we put a, a shell on it just so you could get the idea of how that might look, but that orientation, I don't know why this isn't working, but the orientation on the white box is how it would look if you were looking from across the street at the grocery store. Uh, at the city facility, and that's why that orientation's in that direction, so you can see it. So basically, the, the location of it's 500 west between Center Street and 100 south. So questions come up a number of times, what about redevelopment? So if you look at the right side of the, of the uh, two blocks that comprise the city center complex, um, the, what we've come to identify is, people have asked about re redevelopment, the answer is TBD, it's to be determined. And the reason it's to be determined, and I'll show you in a few minutes what the calendar looks like for the, a project if the bond passes, would be three years out before we could really um, nail down the redevelopment opportunities. But what we have have done is looked at and said, you know, in numerous of the placemakers and other proposals we had in previous years, we had retail facing Center Street, consistent with what's on Center Street now uh, in other parts of Center Street. 
And then whether it's residential or hotel or, 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 or something on that lower right block, there's a potential to, ha to create a basically a nighttime population on these blocks. And when you're talking about economic development in a downtown, you want daytime population, you want nighttime population, you want the ability for retail and restaurants. So those are the kinds of things that, that we would be looking at. <clears throat> so one thing to remember is what is the economic development impact? Basically, the University of Utah's uh, business school uh, established the multiplier effect for projects like this at 2.6 times the hard cost investment. So if you think about a 60, $69 million investment, we'll call it 64 because four is for the fire station number two, but a $64 million fire station at 2.06, you're talking $120, $130 million of economic impact in the downtown, okay? And then that doesn't even cons consider what could happen on the right side when, uh, when that comes in, in three or four years. Okay, when is it? Election day, you know, is Tuesday, November 6, 2018. This is the ballot, or this is the uh, sample of the ballot. That question shows up on the back side of your ballots. Uh, I understand not everybody knows to look over, the, flip it over, but, but you have to do it. It's the very last item on our ballot. Just a note, we, do, we are doing a vote by mail. The deadline is that it has to be postmarked by November 5th. So make your decisions and make them early and get them in. Um, next one. So the two questions I think you're really most interested in is what is, the, what is the plan if the bond passes? Well, we're approaching the end of 2018. If the bond passes on November 6th, and we won't know officially until two weeks later when the Board of Canvassers meets, the first thing that the city will do is engage an architect and a construction management company to oversee the project. Then in 2019, beginning probably early January, working with our bond attorneys, uh, we would issue the bonds and get the best interest rate we can. And then once those bonds are issued, we have about three years to use the money in terms of the projects. Um, we'd also begin to design work. We'd be, purchase the site. We still need to acquire the tire store on the corner, that property. Um, in March, we anticipate we'd complete schematic work, select a general contractor. In April, begin engineering on the site improvements for the property. August, we'd hope to be in a position to award site improvements contract. September, we hope to be able to start that work. In December, we'd like to be in a position to select a contractor for the building construction. And then that construction will continue for a couple of years. In January, we expect that the complete site improvements would be done January of 2020 and that we could begin constructing the building. In 2021, while construction's ongoing, uh, we see that as a good opportunity to start engaging on the redevelopment prospects of the East Block. And remember, we can't do anything with the redevelopment until we actually vacate these buildings. Now, the good news is, in 2022, we anticipate the substantial completion of the building would be in April. We could move into the facilities in June. In July, we could move with uh, demolishing the old city center, and by then, uh, that's, that's a clean slate of land, and the, uh, any redevelopment of that site can begin. That's what happens if the bond passes. What happens if the bond fails? Well, we kind of start over again. Um, except we really don't. We've done a lot of the preliminary work. We have a good idea of what the costs are. We know where the location wants to be. It's very likely that the council would come back in a year or two with another request for a bond. But you have to remember the question then, will the construction costs will go up? Now, we'd still have to operate these facilities. We'd need upgrades. we need to do repairs. And an estimate of that is over time, that could cost $5 million and we still have the immediate space needs for police, fire, and other operations in, within the city. We have focused a lot on the police and fire needs, um, but there are other needs. Our IT department's in, in space that, that's woefully inadequate for their needs, um, and it all just fits together. So what would we do? We'd also have to consider options. We said we could put it back on a bond on it, but realistically, we'd also have to look at other 
options, uh, more alternatives, break it up, do other things with it. Um, but at the end of the day, we still have the same needs, whether we push, push it down for another couple of years or not. Finally, I just want to remind you that if you want to have uh, a lot of information on, uh, on the bond, uh, the city's factual information is provided on voteprovo.com. Are you able to pull that up, Rice? And I've highlighted here that there's videos on the police and fire needs. There's a voter information guide that you should have had mailed to you. Uh, there's a list of frequently asked questions. We've tried to respond to questions that we've seen on social media and they've been directed our way. So there's a lot of those. There's also conceptual drawings. And then Bryce, if you keep going, keep scrolling down, or up or down, whichever way it works. Um, we've also got some graphics about what it represents in terms of space challenges, how a bond works, the timing of the bond. This uh, dollar thing here shows you the property taxes and Provo Cities is the section on the far right, about 17.5% of your total property tax bill. And then we wanted to also show you the last four years how the property tax uh, portions have broken out again. Provost has consistently dropped over those four years. And then um, a little bit further down, we show you things like um, what the property tax revenues are, sales, uh, utility revenues are. And then we also wanted to give you a, just a sense that this is where construction costs are and where they've been going. And, and so when the council uh, voted to, to, to put this on the bond, the reason they did it, um, uh, they re one, of the, one of the things they recognized was that costs are going to go up and they're going to keep going up. Um, so we just wanted to give you all sorts of information on, on how that works. Um, thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Bill Fillmore. I serve as one of the three co-chairs of the Citizens Committee for Provo's Public Safety Bond. Uh, I've thrown together some notes this afternoon. I hope they're helpful to our discussion. My focus is on public safety. Uh, two thirds of the bond will go directly to fire and police departments. The other third goes to a new city hall, new city facility, but I see that as indirectly benefiting public safety as we modernize and integrate all of our city services. Uh, let me first state the obvious. No one likes taxes. No one wants to pay any more than we have to. But I believe firmly that the number one priority, the number one duty of any government, federal, state, or local, has to be the protection of its citizens. There can't be anything more important, nothing. Not roads, not schools, not lifestyle, nothing supersedes the need for public safety. And we have problems here in Provo. Uh, we have put this off way too long and the problem is not going away and it's not getting better. Uh, it's only gonna get more expensive with time. In the meantime, we face all of the usual problems that any growing city has with respect to crime and fires and emergencies and heart attacks and everything else that we use our fire and police personnel for. But I also have a concern that we are not nearly as well prepared as we should be for catastrophes. Whether we're talking about an earthquake, a flood, uh, acts of terrorism, uh, we are not immune from those terrors here in Happy Valley and we need to have the best public service facilities and personnel we possibly can. Part of Provo's culture has always been that of a pioneer heritage. Part of that is making do with what we have, right? Well, we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, the, uh, the facilities we have now were built nearly 50 years ago. They were intended to last for about 30 years. We're now 16 years past that and we've been slapping Band-Aids on the problem ever since, and those Band-Aids are becoming ever more expensive. And the problem is they're gonna get more expensive with time. Uh, the mayor told me just before the meeting that five years ago a study indicated that the new facility we hoped for would have cost, what was it, $45 million, and now we have a $69 million estimate. Construction costs have gone up over 10% in the last 
four or five years, and they're going to continue uh, to do so. Uh, and so if we want to save money, now's the time to act. In our families, you know, we routinely sit down with our spouses and children, and we try to segregate wants versus needs so we can budget effectively. Uh, make no mistake about it, this is a need, not a want. How else can you explain the fact that these seven people behind me and the mayor voted unanimously uh, for this? That's, those of you who watch city affairs know what a rare thing it is on major expenditures that we get a unanimous vote. And these city councilmen behind me have come from different backgrounds. They have different priorities, different biases, different perceptions, but they are unanimous on this. And we simply cannot delay any longer. We need new public safety facilities. These are the people that have to live with this problem every day. They're most keenly attuned to the problems. They're the ones that have to support uh, our fire chief and our police chief here in the rear of the room and deal with their, their unique needs and ever-growing problems. So <clears throat> the current city center, like I said, was built nearly 50 years ago. At that time, we had a little over 50,000 citizens in Provo. We're now approaching 120,000. That's more than double what we had back then. Uh, the building, which was expected to have a 30-year life, is now into its 46th or 47th year. We've been stretching and retrofitting for the past 16 years, or actually more than that. The, the building was built with inform, inferior codes, both earthquake and security matters that are woefully inadequate now in the 21st century. For example, even a moderate earthquake uh, within 20 miles of here will level City Hall and the fire and police departments. Think about that. That's just not lost money or a, a problem to rebuild. If we have such an emergency, the buildings collapse. They cave in, eliminating the very people, vehicles, equipment, and communication structure we need to deal with that kind of an emergency. It's gone. Now, let me talk about the police department in particular. In 1972, we had a total of 46 officers and staff. Now, 46 years later, we have 107 officers. I'm told we need 125 if we lived in a perfect world. Plus, we have 50 staff. That's three times where we started when this building was first occupied. Um, it is an aging, out-of-date, antiquated, dilapidated structure, particularly the police department. Uh, the police department here is so crowded, they've converted virtually every closet to an office. We have people sharing cubicles. We have officers on top of each other trying to do their work. We've lost our gun range. We're storing evidence in rooms with mold and water damage. Even had a sewer reflux into one of the evidence rooms. If we contaminate evidence, we cannot prosecute a crime, and that criminal goes free. It's that simple. We have a very, well, uh, we have problems with our HVAC, with plumbing, electrical, ventilation. Uh, we have police cars that are unnecessarily exposed and subject to vandalism. We've had some incidents. We have a very small intersecting lobby as you enter into the police department. Uh, very small, and because it's at the crossroads of the, of the structure of the, the, the police department, we have intersecting criminals and victims. Uh, we cannot adequately segregate them. And so we have innocent victims sitting there in the lobby waiting to be heard or interviewed, and violent criminals or mentally ill people or drunkards wander in and out. There have been incidents the chief informs me of where there have been acts of violence within the lobby trying to subdue criminals or others. Uh, incidents where mace has been sprayed, and, uh, children sitting there with their parents. <laughs> that's, that's not ideal. Uh, we have very poor security in the building, at least for modern needs. We have insecure entrances and exits. We also have 
Uh, Chief, forgive me, I'm going to go halfway on this. We have a, an extremely serious security problem, which the Chief has sworn me to secrecy about, uh, because we don't want to give anybody any ideas. But we are vulnerable to a devastating uh, uh, incident if the wrong people took a notion to do it. Uh, we need to have far greater security in that building both on the main floors and down in the basement than we now have. It's just a major design flaw that has to be corrected. The building is also energy efficient. In short, we need new utility structure. We need more meeting and training rooms, interview rooms. We need new, more bathrooms. We need uh, a new sally port, a gun range, modern evidence room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's inevitable that some of this leads to morale problems. I don't want to overstate that, but the most telling concern to me as I visit with the chief and with some of the officers is the increasing difficulty they face in recruitment and retention of qualified officers. We lost nine officers last year for various reasons. They were experienced veterans, and so we're a bit top-heavy with rookies, as I understand it. We have to understand that we are competing for quality police officers with neighboring cities. And if they offer better facilities, which translates simply to better support for our officers, we're going to lose more officers. And we're gonna find it more and more difficult to get good, replace, good replacements. That really concerns me. Talk briefly about the fire department. Fire department right next door to the police department has all the same problems. It's an aging, dilapidated, uh, unmodern structure. Uh, but we see the largest problem is station number two, which is in the northeast quadrant of the city. It is simply an old house that was converted to a firehouse, to a fire station. It's super crowded, has the same seismic problems. There's rust, there's mold, there's wires strung everywhere. Uh, the roof and trusses are failing. The vehicle exhaust, filters into the exercise area and the bedroom. Uh, it's simply terribly unhealthy for our firemen. Makeshift repairs have been the band-aid so far, but it's just plain subpar in every way. We need separate rooms. Right now, all administrative functions take place in the TV room. <laughs> if you have a disciplinary discussion or an HR matter with one of the firemen, uh, you have to excuse everybody. And, and, uh, we just don't have the room. In fact, the, the studies indicate that we need at least twice as much room. And to that end, the city uh, wisely has purchased property adjacent to station number two to expand it when it's remodeled. It would be more than twice the current size. Our 9-11 emergency dispatch system now sits in the basement of the Covey Center uh, instead of where it should be. Our entire city IT department is in the basement of City Hall. Both of them are goners in the event of an earthquake or a flood. Thus, I acknowledge that the bond, you know, no one wants to pay more taxes. And this bond is gonna cost, as I understand it, uh, a little less than $10 per month for 20 years for the median house, median value house in Provo. That's not insignificant. It is, however, a 20 year bond for what we hope will be a 50 year benefit but construction costs continue to rise and the problem is not going away. Simply have to bite the bullet and do it now. Maybe all this helps explain in part why our city council, some of the, <laughs> some of the best penny pinchers in Provo have come together and voted 7-0 to unanimously recommend this bond because they are most keenly aware of the problem. They live with it and they know we can't delay any longer. It also explains, I think, why even the Utah Taxpayers Association has gone neutral on this and not recommended against it. The Provo School Board is not opposing it. The Daily Herald supports it and virtually all of our elected leaders support it. Well, think about that. The last thing politicians want to do is endorse a tax increase. But they're almost unanimously behind this for the obvious reason that it's flat out needed, and it's needed now. And I'll say this, if every city voter could do what I have done the last month or so, 
and that is tour the police and fire facilities and even City Hall and talk to our cops and our firefighters and our leaders. I honestly believe that this bond would pass nine to one. Nine to one. The need is so obvious if you just educate yourselves and see what's, what we're facing. We need to support those men and women who support us. Those men and women who put their lives on the line every day. There's no way I could vote no on this bond and then look any of them in the eye. The unintended message to our fire and police personnel would be, at the very least, that we take you for granted. And at the worst, that you're simply just not that important to us. That would be a horrendous mistake. Provo is a great city. And it needs and deserves great public safety facilities. The time to do it is now. I hope you'll join us in voting yes on the bond. Thank you. My name is Diane Christensen. I have no particular credentials to be here other than that I'm a concerned citizen and that I have studied this matter and I was foolish enough to volunteer. <laughs> I thought I would be one of several who would speak and when I was told I was the only one I felt a little bit of trepidation but it is what it is. Um, let me state up front that I'm not speaking for anyone but myself. Others have different reasons for not being able to support the bond. Also, some have expressed criticisms for the people who are supporting and promoting the bond, and I'm not on board with that. I have many friends who wholeheartedly support this bond, and I respect their reasons. We'll still be friends however this goes. But I can't vote for the new city center bond, and this is why. First, a preliminary caution about the messaging overall of the pro position. The hook is, vote for Provo, support the bond. It's a good slogan. But the strong implication is that if you love the city and want it to prosper, then you must vote yes. That's a message that rubs some people the wrong way. It goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that people voting no also care about Provo and we care about the police and fire personnel who serve us. We are grateful to them, and we want them to have adequate facilities too. I had a son who was a police officer. It didn't work out for him as a career, but I have great respect for the men in blue and women. Public safety is a priority, that's clear. But the implication that public safety will cease to function if the vote goes against the bond is logical fallacy. So in some ways the messaging is unfortunate, but the timing is worse. A week ago, I opened up my property tax valuation that comes every year. I, along with thousands of other Provo residents, <clears throat> experienced severe sticker shock. My property taxes went up $250 from last year. Since 1982, when we bought our home, our property taxes have increased in small amounts each year, $20, $30, $50. Then this year, a quantum leap to a $250 increase. Pardon me. Now, why would this be? Well, the county has obligated taxpayers to cover the $42 million conference center bond and the $65 million BRT bond, neither of which we got to vote for. And now they're asking us to say yes on a quarter cent sales tax increase, partly to take care of operations and maintenance on the BRT project, even though I sat in this very room two years ago and was promised along with everyone else that BRT would not raise my taxes. So that's the county. Then we have the school district, which bonded $108 million for new schools in 2014 and wants to bond next year 
or $192 million for more new schools. That's the biggest bite out of my property tax dollar, as I would expect. And yes, I voted for the school district bond, but I won't vote for the next one next year unless they scale it down considerably. Then we have Provo City. We are paying for the $39 million rec center bond. We passed the RAP tax in 2015. There is a surcharge on my utilities bill for iProvo. And as for the rest of my utilities bill, that's not a pretty picture either. I dug out some old utility statements and I found that between 2004 and 2016, a 12-year period, my utilities bill increased 49% in total from $119 to $177. That's reasonable. Then from 2016 to 2018, a mere two-year period, my utilities increased 69% from $177 to $299. This was quite a surprise to me and my husband considering the news from City Hall was that the utilities fee hike would cost the average homeowner as defined by a $230,000 home, pretty close to where mine is valued, and that it would cost us $25 per month in 2017 and $13 per month in 2018. We're careful with our electricity and water consumption, yet our utilities hike averaged $61 a month, not the $25 or the $13 that we were told. Then there's the state of Utah, which increased our gas tax to where we are in the top five states in the nation for high gas prices. And I won't bring up federal taxes because they are a dark mystery to me. I only know that I give them money every April, but I wait until the last possible minute to do it because I am stubborn. And finally, I have a ballot sitting on top of my piano waiting for me to mail, which contains a ballot question for a 10 cent per gallon gas tax increase to benefit Utah schools, a Medicaid expansion question which would result in a 0.15% sales tax increase, the county quarter cent sales tax question I referred to earlier, and a bond to build a new city building in downtown Provo. And I'm sorry if that's a boring and tedious recital of the taxes, fees, surcharges, and bonds that my husband and I are <clears throat> obliged to pay it's tedious to us to have to pay them too. But I bring it up because this decision about the city center bond isn't being made in a vacuum and it can't be. I have to look at the total burden on me and my husband as taxpayers and not just on us, but on people who live in this city who are even less able to absorb these continual financial hits. There are many people in Provo homeowners who are on fixed incomes and they are drowning in these financial waters. I found it ironic that an hour ago we were having a discussion in this room about <clears throat> providing affordable housing while all the time we are putting financial burdens on homeowners in this city to where people can't afford to live here anymore. Um, for some of these people, it's not a matter of, oh, well, we won't go on a vacation to Disneyland this year. It's a matter of which medication will I go without so that I can pay my property taxes? Or which one of us gets to go in and explain why we can't pay our utilities bill and beg the city not to turn the lights off? The tax burden begins to be overwhelming. It really does. And when I consider that we have looming ahead of us, not only that huge school bond I already mentioned, but an equally huge obligation to renovate our wastewater plant at a cost of $210 million, then this is the bottom line for me. We can't do it all. Just like the family who has more bills to pay than they have money in the bank, and they're already in debt for their mortgage and their car, we have to set some priorities. I have to say that if having a functioning sewer system takes priority over a new city building. Even if the wastewater plant could limp by for another year or two, as I understand it, the federal government is mandating a renovation. <clears throat> and anyway, would we really want to roll the dice on having clean water to drink or to risk people's ability to flush the toilet and have the city sewer system work the way it's supposed to? That's a public health issue of primary importance. 
If we were to create a Maslow's pyramid, clean water would come before a new city building. I don't believe it's realistic to say that we can both do both now and while we're at it, build more schools, all the while paying what we're already bound to. This is what I think. I think this bond question will fail because voters are going to look at their ballots and see multiple bond and tax issues and get irritated. Traditionally, fiscally conservative Utahns, when they see that, they vote no on all of them. Not always, but that's, the, that's what traditionally usually happens. Uh, people say enough. If, that, if I'm right, and after that happens, then I suggest that the city take a close look at the use of space in the existing building. I know it's not ideal, and I'm not saying it will last for very much longer. But there's, here's an example. Do people really need to pay their utility bills in a space that takes up most of the main floor of our city building? Or could they do that elsewhere, as they used to do just a few years ago, and you could give that space to public safety? I'm saying make it work for a little longer while you decide how to tackle the more pressing issue of the wastewater system. Get that underway and explain to taxpayers how that's going to work. I know it will take 10 years, so I'm not saying that it has to be completed, but get it underway and bring the taxpayers along with you, and then come back and make your case for a new building. In short, I personally am not opposed to a new city building, per se, but I can't support this bond because the timing is not right, there is another more crucial need, and the price tag of $69 million is just too high. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Diane. Um, appreciate your comments and your concerns and we will now take a few minutes and turn the time over to, to you for questions if anyone has any questions you have council members you have mayor cliff has a microphone that he would be glad to get to you so just raise your hand and give him a second to get to you we do have the experts in the field um, that can answer a lot of the questions. Again, we're giving you as much information. We're not here to tell you how to vote tonight. If you wanna to talk to us offline, we can do that. But uh, tonight we wanna to give you as much information as you would like. And um, we'll turn the time to you. Thank you. A reminder to please state your name. Right, thank you, uh, Aaron McCullough. I wonder who can speak to the site questions that came up, the mall versus the ancestry building versus the existing block. Can somebody run through the, the whys and why nots? Wayne, do you wanna, you've been involved the longest. Thank you, excellent question. Um, I'll try to be brief. I'm summarizing about seven or eight years worth of uh, research in a very short period of time. Um, so uh, a as Cliff indicated in his presentation, we have known now for at least eight or nine years that we were coming up against some deadlines. Uh, we recognized that if we were gonna stay in this building, we needed to make some substantial investments in the millions of dollars just to hold the building together. It's coming apart at the seams. If anybody's been on the tours, you've, you've seen that. Um, and so rather than continuing to look at this question of do we keep putting money into the money pit, um, uh, should we be looking at some other alternatives? And so we began looking uh, as early as 2013-14 uh, at alternatives. Um, so the most recent series of alternatives we looked at, I would characterize kind of in three categories. Um, one of those was to find an existing building that was large enough to meet our space needs. And, um, and so we looked at a number of them. We actually went to the county and explored the idea of purchasing the old county courthouse 
from the county. As massive as that building looks, there's 32,000 square feet of usable space in the building. It's all an atrium. Um, there, and, uh, and the retrofit of that building uh, wouldn't have even begun to address our, our space needs. Uh, we looked specifically at the Ancestry.com building, which is 130,000 square feet, uh, sits in at the uh, entrance to the Riverwoods Business Park up in North Provo. Um, candidly, we could have made that work with the exception of the fact that the ceiling heights are relatively low in the building, and uh, because of some of our needs, particularly for a room like this where you can have a dais and um, and, and need the space, we would have had to add on to the building to make that work. And by the time you bought the building, refurbished, again, a 25-year-old building, and added a council chambers and or courtroom to the building, the cost very closely approximated um, building new. Um, and so we, uh, we spent several months looking at that, including bringing an architect on board and trying to estimate, figure out how we could make that work. Um, we then uh, were approached, and in fact, one of the reasons why we're having this discussion today was we were approached by the uh, new owners of the Provo Town Center Mall to explore the idea, um, and, and actually, maybe I shouldn't say we were approached by them. I think we actually initiated it when they came to us and said, we have to find a new user for the Sears building, and we're thinking about office. And I asked, how many square feet in the building? And they said about 140,000 square feet. And so we began a discussion around uh, whether that property could be used at, as a replacement for City Hall. Um, we did have a time constraint from uh, Brixton in which to respond um, because they are sitting on a big empty building that's generating no income and costing them a fair amount of money every month. And so they were anxious to find a tenant for the building. So we explored tenancy, we explored purchasing the building, we explored purchasing uh, additional space in the mall or leasing additional space in the mall to cover the square footage gap. Um, we went pretty far down that path. Um, and uh, Brixton kind of came to us and said, you know, we can't wait around forever. We can't hold this building. We'll continue to market it. Um, and so they sort of asked us to uh, come to a, and, and this is maybe overemphasizing the idea of a fisher cut bait, but we were getting pretty close to that. Um, and so that accelerated our efforts at exploring other alternatives. So we looked at those existing buildings. Um, we actually explored for a while purchasing the Wells Fargo building. Um, part of the, the building's condominiumized and some of the space was in foreclosure. Um, and so we looked really hard at that one. We actually looked at the night block building uh, as a potential and explored those alternatives and finally concluded that there just wasn't a really good fit uh, that could function at a reasonable cost. Um, and in every case, in some cases, we were looking at buildings that are you know, significantly older than this one. Um, and so again, we, uh, we began to look at then two other alternatives. One was to, in order to meet the space needs and to provide the seismic safety, we looked at the idea of building a new police and fire headquarters building on this block and then refurbishing the existing city space um, to accommodate um, our long-term needs. Um, that ended up being almost identical to the price of retrofitting, purchasing and retrofitting the space at the Provo Town Center Mall. Um, and, and had some, uh, there were some advantages and some disadvantages. One of the big concerns was that in order to retrofit this space, we'd actually have to move out. And it was about a two year project to get seismic safety into this building. So we began at re asking the question, where do we lease 64,000 square feet of space uh, while we retrofit this building uh, for a two year period? And pretty soon the costs of, of retrofitting the building started escalating beyond the cost of the uh, Town Center Mall project. And so, uh, so we, we kept it in the mix, we considered it carefully, we again did space needs analyses and looked at how we might structure that, and at the end of the day it wasn't any cost advantage at all compared to the situation with the mall. So the final we op option we looked at was to, and we called it the scrape and build new idea, which was to say, can we consolidate? Right now we sprawl over this campus um, because we're in two levels and three levels in this building. Um, and, uh, and so we raised the question, could we build on a smaller footprint, thereby becoming more efficient? Could we build a taller footprint 
um, again, which would allow us the opportunity to redevelop some of this space and create some advantage uh, to the downtown beyond just replacing City Hall. So we began a careful analysis of that process and as we brought all three proposals back to the Municipal Council to consider, they went through a, um, a public process where we uh, contracted with Y2 Analytics to do a, uh, some focus groups and a citizen survey to evaluate the three options. We engaged our Open City Hall tool, uh, which allows us to, uh, to educate and uh, solicit feedback. And we held uh, four, I think, open houses and, um, and a number of other uh, public meetings and tours of the facility. And uh, based on all that information that was then gathered by the Municipal Council, um, they deliberated carefully over a period of several weeks and reached the conclusion that they would advance to the public a bond, which would be a good 50-year solution. Uh, they also asked us to do what we call the 50-year total cost of ownership analysis, where we looked at all three of the options that were on the table. We went out 50 years and said, if we have to add on space as growth occurs, if we, uh, if we capitalize the value of um, utility costs, uh, maintenance costs, looking at the age of the building, as well as more energy efficient facilities, and then we took that out 50 years and we brought it back to a net present value, so we had a basis of comparison. Um, there was an 8% gap between the lowest and the highest alternative. And again, the council's value judgment, uh, and we elect them to make value judgments, their value judgment was that to get a new building that would last 50 years and at a cost differential of 8% over that 50-year time period was probably a wise approach to make. And so that's the basis on which they reached that conclusion. So very long answer to describe uh, what's an even longer process. Who's next? My name's Robin Roberts. I own a business here in Provo and I've lived here all my life here in Provo. I don't mind paying taxes, you know. I've been doing it all my life and but I, I like to make sure that it's it's cost effective for me. If the cactus get too high, we we just can't afford it. I can't stay in business. Uh, and and I, the two questions I have uh, is uh, here in the bond, uh, one of them is the estimated, it says uh, the 20 year estimated amount on a 265,000 primary residence and the estimated amount, and it, and it says the amount here on a business having the same value. Th those are not even close to the same values. You take a house uh, at, at a certain uh, square footage in a business and it's three or four times that. So I'm just wondering where you got that median uh, price range. Uh, looking at my own business and my own house, I don't feel myself at an upper-ended uh, person. I feel myself as a middle middle class, and th these aren't even close. Uh, it, it 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 was going to cost me, and and what I figured, close to sixty thousand dollars over a twenty-year period uh, for my business and my home. So uh, that th these aren't even close to the values. Robin, can yes, you John, answer that. You hop along, you stay there. We'll bring the mic to you. The $265,000 median price on a home was, was a study that was done earlier this year, and that is, a, that is an accurate number. The number for the business, we wanted to just be open and transparent, and so we just kept the same value and showed that it was higher because for a personal residence, you get a 45% deduction if it's your primary residence, and so that lowered the tax, where if you're a business, you don't get that. But if you need any help or want to, we can show you on different values what the impact would be on a business. But we did not collect the data for the median price of a business. We just went with the same value. Yes. Um, one of the things I'd add to that is that state law constrains us with respect to a lot of the process. And so with respect to the business value, State law mandates that the number we give you is for a business that's of the same value of the median home. So state law doesn't allow us. In fact, we, we went through a, a draft of the, of the information we were going to disseminate where we actually had the median business value on the form. But state law requires that we provide you the value for a business that is the same value as the median home value. So we didn't have any choice about that issue. Essentially, it shows you what the what the rate, how the rate applies.
in here that says the city has other outstanding bonds for which a tax decrease would occur upon the retirement of such bonds, which may not occur if the proposed bonds are issued. What is that supposed to mean? Well, basically what happens uh, on bonds that are issued their general obligation bonds, which means that they are paid back through the property taxes that are collected from the residents. Each year as the value of your home goes up, because the principal payment on the bonds stays the same, that the actual rate can slightly go down if the values increase. And so, but if there are new bonds that were issued for this bond, then it would it would be the same thing. They would be issued originally and your rate would be X and then as the value of your home went up, that rate would actually go down slightly because you would have, because you could have a couple things that happen. Number one, the value of your home could go up. The other thing is there could be new businesses or new homes that would also share in making that bond payment and so therefore your portion would go down slightly. It's also a reference, it's Robin, it's also a reference to the idea that when other bonds fall off, gets paid off, your tax rates will go down. It's not a case of where we're waiting for this one to finish and then start a new one. It's, the, 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 for example, the um, recreation center bond, when that finishes up, that will drop off and lower your rate as well. Could, could I... Could I could I try? I, this is speculation on my part, but in part I wanted to come to the, the, the microphone in part to, uh, to thank our two speakers earlier. Um, really appreciate their efforts and, and what courage that, that took. And uh, I appreciate both of them for, for sharing those perspectives. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate the perspectives that, that you shared. Um, pure speculation on my part. I've read that and I, and I scratched my head and tried to figure out like, what is that supposed to mean? The closest thing that, that I can come up with, and if someone knows that, if, that this is inaccurate, go ahead and, 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 and correct me. But, um, I mean, it says bonds. We only have one, one other general obligation bond, so I mean, the, the plural is incorrect. I think it's, it's kind of boilerplate language. But what I've seen before is, and I believe it was uh, with the rec center, uh, we structured the bond that we had smaller payments up front until the library bond fell off. And once the library bond fell off, then the amount that we were paying on the rec center ballooned to fill up that gap. So instead of, instead of starting up high and then the, the library dropped off, we just stepped up and we kept constant. And so in that scenario, we would have had a tax decrease once another bond was retired but it didn't happen because we structured the repayment of the rec center bond to kind of wrap around the library bond. That's my best guess at what that's trying to say, but I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. Robbie, could I pass this on now? Yeah, John, help me with that because I do have, I was under the, I am under the uh, understanding that when the bond is paid off, the only way to keep that same money would be go back to the truth and taxation that we would have to take that off the, the property tax. Is that correct? It has to drop off, according to state law. Or the voters have to approve another bond. Yes. And I, I spoke with bond. Now, that language came from our bond council. There's, out, there's an outside attorney uh, firm that we use whenever we do bonds because they're specialists in, in doing bond stuff. And um, I spoke with him about that language. Again, it's another, it's another statement that's required by state law. My understanding from speaking with him about the purpose of it is to warn you that if you're, if you're looking at your tax bill right now and thinking about what's going to happen to it after the rec center bond goes away, if this band, bond passes, what you're expecting to happen won't completely happen because now there's a new bond. So the example I tried to give to Robin a minute ago is just pulling numbers out of the air. If, you're, if your annual bond payment right now is $300 and 
and when the rec center bond goes away, you were expecting it to go to 200. If this bond passes, it's going to go from 300 up to 400, and when the rec center bond goes away, it's going to drop to 300, not to 200. Right? Not because it's affecting the amount of tax that you're paying on the rec center, because that's gone, but your tax bill has changed because there's now additional bonds on, and everybody's giving me blank looks, just like when I tried to explain this to Robert. All I'm trying to say is that it's, it's a warning that if your bill goes up because new bonds go on, then when bonds, it, it, it's still going to go down by the same amount, it's just not going to go down to the same dollar amount that it would have gone down to because now there's something else. Okay, but John, is that accurate to your, in your understanding? Okay. <laughs> My name is John Payne, a longtime resident of Provo City. I've been listening to uh, several different sessions of this bond issue at City Council as well as here. I don't agree, or so I don't disagree with the, with the need or the timing. I don't disagree with the with the need or the timing. What I do disagree with is how this is structured. And who's going to pay for it? I understand that this will be a property tax increase. But 44% of the property owners in Provo City will be paying this for the next 20 years. Because 56% of the properties are exempt. Either state, county, city, uh, BYU, uh, other institutions. So... 44% of us who own property will be burdened with this whole bond for the next 20 years. And I think that's unfair. I think I see all the improvements that are going to be here. I'm not against police protection. I'm not against uh, improving the fire. Uh, I'm, not improve, I'm not against improving the city offices. I think that will benefit all of us as citizens. But the actual citizens and the number of citizens who are going to be paying for this is unfair because of a small part of us when it comes down to the actual numbers of people who write out those checks to pay their property taxes is about 25 percent of the actual citizenry of Provo City. Why can't this be structured in such a way that all of the citizens participate when they're all going to be receiving benefits? I think this is an unfair burden on those people who own property and benefiting all the rest of the citizens uh, of Provo City. So I, I think this needs to be restructured. That, therefore, I'm against this bond and how it's structured. I'm not against what it's doing. I'm not against uh, the need. I'm not against what it's going to accomplish. I'm not against the timing. But the bond issue and how it's structured is unfair. That's what I'm up against. I'd like to find out if you can't structure this in such other way that you can share this between the property owners as well as um, people who are benefiting from sales taxes. Uh, I, I don't know what other revenue can be uh, generated, but um, I think it needs to be done differently than just put on the, bur on the backs of those people who own property. That's discriminatory in my opinion. Well, John, thank you. You make a great argument, and uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. So let, let me just characterize it in a couple of ways. Um, one, state law provides um, the mechanism for doing uh, uh, general obligation bonds, and it is a property tax base. Uh, the city does not have the right to increase its sales tax levy. It is fixed by state statute. We get 1% um, of the sales taxes generated, and the only change to that is when the voters approve a wrap tax, which gives you an extra one-tenth of a percent, and that money's earmarked for parks and recreation, essentially. Um, and so the only mechanism the city has to raise a tax is the property tax. Now, that being said, let me come back, and Diane mentioned a number of the other things that go on in the city, like gas taxes and like utility fees and so on. Those are spread among all ratepayers, 
And again, ratepayers and taxpayers are not the same group. Most of us are both, but there are many folks who are not both. Uh, so ratepayers, for example, when we are preparing now to consider the um, you know, what to do with the wastewater treatment plant, the, if we if we issue a bond or do a loan of some kind associated with that, it will be spread across all who pay sewer fees. That includes BYU and the hospital and anyone who's on our sewer system. And so that is that is not paid for by the taxpayers group. It's paid for by the ratepayers group. Um, I can tell you that we make every effort in the city to try to spread those things as far across the base as we can. Um, now, from a property tax perspective, I think there's a good argument that uh, property tax exempt entities don't contribute directly to the bond, and I don't disagree with that. Um, but there are, for example, we think about all the renters in our community. Renters live in homes or apartment buildings that are subject to property tax. Hopefully, owners pass those on uh, to the extent they can to their uh, renters um, and uh, and don't shoulder that burden all by themselves. And so again, I think I, I think as we think about this, I wish there were a way to do a bond uh, of this scale to in, and to do it in a way that would raise a sales tax, for example. I think that'd be a whole lot more fair. We actually would get um, uh, tourists who are coming into our town and spending money at our restaurants and, and going to the convention center and staying in hotels, they could contribute to the cost of that. It's just not a mechanism the state allows us to use. So um, I would love if we could get that opportunity to do it in a different way. But, uh, but right now, that's the, uh, for, a, for a bond particularly of this scale, absent raising some tax rate, I don't know what the answer is. So I, I don't know if that's helpful. But Who's next? One other thing about that, it's, it's really hard to assess fees for fire and police. I want you to take one second, think about the tragedy that just happened in Salt Lake. How do you go to the family and charge them for the, all the effort that the police is done, are doing to satisfy the family and help the family through this situation? Our police, fire, and to a large extent, um, people that work in the, in the city hall, they don't, they're, some of them more get paid, yes, I, I understand that, but our police and fire, they don't bill for their services. And so I, it, it's a challenge to be able to raise that money for those people that use the fee. We do that with sewer, we do that with electricity, we do that with water, but fire and police are a different animal. It's a challenge, I, I agree. John, I, I added my property tax up and I'm still limping. I agree, um, and I agree with, with what Mr. Parker said. We look at every opportunity to, um, to spread out the costs because of, I think Provo is in a very unique situation that we have such a high uh, percentage of our land that is tax exempt. Um, but I think the uh, utility transportation fee is actually, you know, a great example of a creative way that we're trying to spread that out as much as possible. The the, the one counter argument, and again, I, I agree, but a counter argument we, we need to look at is, you know, we, we look at BYU, very large, large property owner, landowner. There is not subject to, to to property taxes, but if you were to say you know, as a community, are we glad that they're here? Are they contributing in other ways? Are they bringing in sales tax dollars, you know, in, uh, uh, indirectly? And, um, and while, again, I, I, I agree with, with, with some of the problems that causes, but I think on a whole, I think um, Provo is a special place because of many of those tax exempt um, entities that are here. And there are some pros and there are some cons with that. My name's Eric Sosa. Um, I've grown up in Provo, attending BYU right now. Um, my question, I saw a Google Doc with the costs the, for the three options, um, and it says the 68.9 million for this option. Um, but I was curious where that figure came from, 
Um, I've heard the phrase that it, architectures came up with it and it wasn't actual construction estimators. So I'm just curious how that number was arrived at. Yeah, apparently so. <laughs> so e excellent question, Eric. Thank you. Um, so um, as we went through, we, we cited up here and we've put out on the Google Drive um, all of the documents that have been associated with putting this together. So so we went through, uh, we did the original space needs analyses back in 2012 and 2013. I think that's right. Um, uh, we've, as we sort of refreshed this issue, um, we went back and took another hard look at the space needs questions. We looked, uh, for, one, for one thing, the space needs analyses were uh, on a 2040 basis, and so we asked the question, number one, is that still realistic? And number two, if we don't have to build and finish the space until maybe 10 or 12 years from now, uh, wouldn't we be smart to essentially just shell in some of the space in the building uh, rather than building it out and then having it sit vacant until the needs arose? And so we uh, we retained an architecture firm to help us go through and analyze those costs. So we looked at current cost estimates based on similar projects. And again, this is not the only public safety building that's being considered in Utah today. And we looked at Cottonwood Heights and a number of others who've been re fairly recent ones. Um, and so we looked at a we looked at every office, every conference room, every restroom, every elevator, every you know public space, every reception area, um, and went through uh, the, those space needs analyses and tried to get them down number one to a very realistic number. And asking the question: Are there is there some space that we can shell in at substantially less than finishing it and building it out? Um, and so we came up with kind of a model on that basis then. And then we looked at, we went through a number of alternatives, and you can see those in that, that um, analysis sheet that we put up there. We looked at things like, are we talking about building all masonry? Are we looking at tilt-up concrete? Are we looking at steel and glass? And what's a reasonable estimate um, you know, per square foot for those kinds of things? Um, so we raised all of those questions. Um, and then we uh, essentially did the math. Um, looked at how it would go. We looked at some industry standard numbers for actual space versus burden space, as how I'd characterize it. So for example, if you have an office, you also have a hallway. Well, you don't necessarily estimate the, the width and size of the hallway, but you know for every office, you need roughly a certain number of square feet per hallway. So we kind of went to that level of detail. Um, and then we took current cost estimates we also assumed, for example, as you probably know, if you've seen the news lately, we have a multi-billion dollar building project going on in Salt Lake County right now, uh, building a new terminal at the airport. There are 1,800 construction workers on that job today. Um, there is a giant sucking sound occurring from North Salt Lake County uh, that is affecting construction prices everywhere else in the Wasatch Front. And so we took that into account. We took into account steel tariffs, which are brand new numbers that uh, we recognize are creating some challenges. So we did all the estimating, and then we went to an independent construction estimator. We gave them all our numbers and said, what do you think? And they came back and said, you're not uh, you're, you're not realistic. We need to up these numbers in this area, in this area, in this area to be realistic. And that's where the 68.9 million dollar number came from. Um, w one more question. I'll I'll shut up after this, but uh, might show how naive I am. It's just a face value question, though. What what happens or what will happen in four years or so when this? is leveled and we redevelop it. And someone mentioned redevelopment earlier. Maybe it went way over my head, but what will happen with any revenue stream money incoming from whatever happens on where we're sitting now? Will that go to offset whatever, you know, can we pay off the bond earlier with that money? I, again, might be a really ignorant question, but can someone answer it nonetheless? <laughs> It's not at all an ignorant question, so thanks for asking. Um, so the, the, way, the way bonds are structured is we have a level, much like your mortgage, unless you're on a variable rate mortgage, and we never do a variable rate bond, just so you know. But, um, but you have a fixed principal and interest payment uh, monthly for 30 years or 20 years, however long your mortgage is. Uh, the bond works very similarly to that. We have a fixed uh, stream of outflow payments. Now, um, 
We are, as we've looked at the economics of doing uh, the redevelopment project here, we recognize there could be some revenues associated with that. For example, we could sell a piece of ground for redevelopment. So if you look at the site plan, I guess it's out in the hallway. Yep, uh, we, we've shown uh, the east, basically the eastern half of this campus could be redeveloped in some fashion in a variety of ways. Oh, there it is right there, okay. Um, so you can see, for example, we show retail along Center Street and a potential other redevelopment along with surface parking. So one of the challenges, uh, as we looked at this, we could certainly generate some dollars from the sale of land or a long-term lease of the land underneath that development. Um, and if that were to materialize, we could use those to, to reduce the cost in a year or two, depending on how much the money was, um, we can't change the principal and interest outgo, and we can't spread it over a longer period of time because the bond holders are expecting a stream of revenue associated with, say, with property tax. It's the most secure uh, investment because they know we have to raise property taxes if we can't meet the principal and interest. But we could offset some of the earlier bond payments, uh, at least in part. We can't go more than three years because we're limited in by law constraint in terms of a general obligation bond. Um, now that being said, um, as we look at this, if you were to bring in some substantial redevelopment, let's say a residential complex there or a hotel uh, to support the convention center, we go from $1,800 of parking space to $18,000 of parking space if we have to build a parking structure, if have to cram more parking onto a smaller piece of ground. And so that some of those extraordinary costs could offset some of the benefits, and that's a decision that will have to be made as we get closer to 2022, and we see what the economy is doing at that point and what construction costs have done. Um, but, I, yeah, it's, it's very clear. And, again, I, I should mention we tried to look at some of the economics around these choices, and, and none of the numbers in terms of taxes are to be, to, to be thought they would make a huge difference. They're in the low five figures uh, in a year for property tax and sales tax. Um, and we're talking about uh, you know a couple of million dollars a year in bond payments. So odds are it would be pretty negligible even if we were to take that revenue stream and plug it in. Um, but nonetheless, the, the council's been very clear that whatever revenue could be generated from this ground, we would use to uh, either offset costs which means we wouldn't have to bond as much or to offset the principal and interest payments. But again, I think it's going to be, um, you know, economy could change an awful lot in the next three years. Um, you know, we did a market analysis four years ago to look at redeveloping the entire block here if we were to move off. And uh, one of the answers we got was, well, we should definitely do a hotel because we need a hotel for the convention center. Well, the Hyatt Place just opened with 140 rooms in it. That's probably no longer the case. So we're, we've been a little reluctant to go very deep into that at this stage of the game before we really know what the economy is going to look like and what other developments might occur downtown that would compete with us. So I hope that's helpful, but it's a complex question. We said we were going to, we'll get to Pam one second here. We said this would go until 9 o'clock. I think that most of us or all of us are willing to stay a little longer if you need to. I'd like to remind you that the mayor is also doing a listening tour, and that will be Thursday night at 7 o'clock at uh, the Centennial Middle, Centennial Middle School. Thank you, Mayor. And if you don't get your questions answered tonight, but and we what's that yeah we'll get to pam i we'll get to her in one second and if there's others i i think we're willing to stay i don't want to go much past 9 30 but anybody that would like to ask further questions i think and if you need to leave feel free to leave but uh we want to answer as many questions as we can tonight but thursday night at centennial middle school the mayor's listening tour is we'll be there and then facility tours Thursday afternoon, Saturday morning, and next Monday evening. Uh, more details can be found uh, on the mayor's blog. I'm Pam Jones. I live in Edgemont, about two blocks from Fire Station 2. Uh, so that's very important to me. Uh, the council knows me, 
several of the past councils and mayors know me because every time they uh, even hint at a tax hike or bond or something, I'm going to give them grief. And Mayor Curtis was kind enough to give me a couple of appointments, one-on-one, -on -one, where I could vent my complaints. And I said, I feel like we're wasting money on things like parks. Yeah, everybody likes parks and support the Covey Center and all that stuff for the rap tax. But it's not a need. And I chastised him uh, five or six years ago when he first hinted at rebuilding the city center because I didn't want another bond. I'm on a, a fixed income. I can't go knocking on Social Security's door every time the city uh, says, well, we need this and that that's new and we have to raise taxes. And I said, I've never had an economics class, but it seems to me one of the very foundational principles is that if you have a debt to pay off and your regular income isn't enough, then you need to find an another source of revenue. <clears throat> I said, for instance, we've got, I know Provo has a limited geographical space for development. And because of the population increase, we're having to build a lot more housing. I said, what about retail development? Um, even factories um, that, that manufacture things. Uh, businesses that will create a sales tax property tax uh, revenue. And he said, well, we've been working on this and that. And I know some, uh, if you're sleeping and you live on the west side, you know we, <laughs> we need a market, a grocery store over there on the other side of I-15. Uh, that's a very complicated situation. OK, but where else in the city uh, where else can you look for businesses to come in here to increase the city's income? Hi, Keith McQueen, a Provo resident. I wasn't actually expecting to ask a question, but something came, I have a couple of questions, I guess, in mind. One was you've looked at other properties where you might be able to, uh, that you might have been able to use. And I wondered, did you, is it possible to look at these properties without perhaps turning them into your dream home, so to speak? Um, I mean, the Ancestry building is a nice, very large building, but maybe it doesn't have to be completely refitted. Maybe it can serve as a temporary house without having to rebuild the entire thing and, and high ceilings, I, I don't know. Just a thought. Um, another thought was, what happens with cost overruns? If, if it turns out that everything costs more than you anticipated, um, what happens next? Can we speak to your Ancestry.com question? Um, happily, it's sold. So that one's off the table, and we'll bring in tax base, and, and we'll help the city. Um, so we're glad to see that one taken care of. Um, what was your second half of the question? Oh, cost overruns. So as we've been looking into the numbers, as Wayne talked about, and we've had consultants talk to us, we've built in, haven't we, John, a 10% coverage just in case. Is that the best way to say it, Wayne? Yeah, that's the beauty of a general obligation bond. It ties our hands. We're 
or done. And to speak to John Payne, I fight that every day, just so you know. The BYU issue of, I get asked that question actually when I'm out of state with other mayors. They, they cannot fathom how we run our city with BYU being non-taxable. It's really an interesting component and it's hard. It makes it really hard. So uh, when you come up with the million dollar answer, we will put your name up in lights. So if you can come up with a way to get BYU to <laughs> jump on board, I would love it. <laughs> Yeah. And did you, uh, yeah, and did you see who it was tied to the most? Because it will tell you who is causing it to go up that much. This year it was the school board. Yes. Yes. And they all come from the same pocket. Most of my properties are rental properties, and I can't increase my rents to cover that. Yeah. That's the problem. And if they go up 40% every year, that's 400% in 10 years. That's half of the life of the bond. We can't afford that. Yeah. It's not fair for us as property owners to fund all the rest of the improvements for the next 20 years for everyone for to all use. the rest of the city to benefit from. And I totally understand that. And like I've said in my other bond presentations, when is it a good time to go out for a bond? When is it the best time? 20 years, do you think it's going to be better, more cost effective? It, So that's the trick when it comes to the federal government, how much they lock our hands with this, like Brian talked about. There's so many stipulations and parameters around it that it really does tie our hands to a general obligation bond, basically. It's one of the only options. Is there? Am I missing something, Brian? Mayor, there's a tool that doesn't get used in Utah because the legislature doesn't allow it. In, in some states and jurisdictions, you can do what they call PILT, uh, Payments in lieu of taxes, mm -hmm. nonprofit, or, you know, from government agencies and such. That's not a tool that's available in Utah. Yes, federal government uses on federal lands. Does anyone on the council want to speak to this? I I asked John today. I said he's been here 22 years now, and he mentioned that uh, as far as our taxes go. He is, in 22 years, we, Provo City has raised their taxes one time, 2015, and it was 2.3%. In 22, and I think it, before John was here, Provo City has not raised their property tax. Just so you're aware, they, the city has not raised its property tax. That's for the general fund. So we, we have had bonds. We've had the library bond. We've had the rec, bond, rec center bond. We've had, um, but when we have had to raise fees, there's no question. Um, when you think about the fees for electricity, coal is costing, to get electricity for, um, from coal, it costs a lot more than it used to because of the environmental protection that is necessary. So your electric rates are going to go up. Every, those are fees that we have to pay if we want them. Those are the challenges that we face. We tie fees to what you use, the general obligation bonds um, tax we have not raised for 22, and I think it's 24 years. Well, it's the same, I think, John, isn't it? Why isn't it, as far as general, uh, util, oh, utility rates, you're right, you're right. We're still limited though by how much you can work within the, the rate structure. The rates are supposed to be based on what it costs. And that's with fees, and it's hard to adjust fire. Like I tried to mention before, we can't adjust fire and police. We can't attach it to a fee because we all get a general safety from it. We all get general safety from it. And I understand that, John. It's painful. When we have, we are a unique city. It's, I, I, I get it. I get it. And um, the state legislature has basically tied our hands as far as how a city can raise money.
not by well it can through our state legislators and that's what we're where we'll need to come back and talk with them but it's because it's a real challenge you notice today one of the issues on the bond i mean the the, the ballot this time is to actually go to a place that says if a, a state agency is renting someplace they should be entitled to tax exempt status and that would actually lower those property taxes to some degree for if you're rent to it but that means less money to to help out with other things because it's rented to a state agency so the city will get less and the schools will all get less money because of that to the gentleman's question about um, cost overruns, mm -hmm. Peter Moyes um, put those estimates together. Oh, Gall. I, I kind of hate to do this. I, 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 said I, I set a goal not to say anything in this meeting. Um, the city has done something remarkable that we just haven't seen before. Um, almost every uh, study and analysis that we've done, they've posted on the web page. And so the general public has access to all the, all the analysis that we put together. As we looked at costs for the buildings, we did it by what we call by systems analysis. We uh, looked at the cost of the structural system, the cost of the building skin, the cost of the mechanical system, cost of each component. And within the document, if you, if you get into it, you'll see that uh, we put down a low, a medium, and a high range of, of, of what's available. And we led the city down a path that would try to find the most cost responsible component for every element of the building. Some things we just need to have last longer. Um, other things, it's, it's, it's frills, and we just don't want frills. After we did that process and came to the initial cost for the building, we then uh, placed in, as was said, a 7% inflation factor per year and prorated it forward anticipating that construction would not start until essentially a year from now. And then on top of that, we plugged in a 10% contingency. Now the contingency is there just for the what ifs that you were talking about. We hope that we don't have to spend it. And, and if we don't have to spend it, there might be a, a, a relief that comes in on, on the bond side of that. But it's in that number because the last thing we want to have happen is to get partway into this project and come back and say, we just didn't put in the right dollars. That would be disaster on top of disaster, right? Um, with all of that in mind, the city then took a very dramatic step that um, whoever the architect is that, that designs this building has got to very carefully think through. From the square footage that's needed, the city said, we're going to take 15,000 square feet of the needed square footage, and we're just going to shell it right now. We're not even going to finish it out. And that way, when, we, when the time comes that we really are pressed for it, the space is encapsulated, but, not, but not, uh, the finishes aren't installed. That allows us to drop the initial construction costs significantly by millions of dollars. Um, but it also gives a relief valve so the city doesn't have to go through this very painful process again in two years or five years or ten years. And, and while I'm uh, with the mic, I, I'm going to get on a little bit of a, of a curious side note. We did an analysis in 2013 of the amount of space that was needed for every department in this building. And we said, look at your future growth and, and, and really think this through carefully. And we met with every department, and there was very little projected future growth. Every department would try to be really careful. We did the same exercise in 2018, five years later, and the numbers were virtually identical. Every department that we've interfaced with here in Provo has operated not just on a shoestring budget for what they do, but on a shoestring staff for what they do. I've done a lot of facilities in a lot of places. I haven't seen a place like Provo do what you've done. It's really you're really just outside the box. Um, we've tried to be financially conservative in where we were going. What's really remarkable is the staff has tried to be staff conservative. I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just so different. I, I've, I've got to commend the city and the staff for, 
the way they look at things. I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, you know, I, I, my reputation just can't afford to have missed the mark. And so we tried really hard to cover that. And, and Provo City can't afford it either. Thank you. Let me give you a couple information bits. This website, or this, if you put that data into a search bar on the internet, you'll go to all those documents he was describing. We also have, that's a different set of documents that you see, then you see at voteprovo.com. Also, if you have questions that don't get answered tonight, do you think of the next couple of days? We have a link on opencityhall.com. Is that right? Open, give it to me again. OpenCityHall.Provo.org. OpenCityHall.Provo.org. You can ask the questions and we'll get you answers. And again, frequently answers questions we have already got are up there, so it's available. Who else has a question or comment? I'm sorry to slow things down, but I, I want to try one more time to address Robin's question because I screwed it up so bad last time. Uh, it occurred to me, I think there's two reasons why it's confusing. One is because it's so obvious that it shouldn't need to be said, and so it th seems like it must mean something else. And the second thing is that it, because it has to do with bond payments, people don't know how that works. So I'm going to give you an example related to your budget. Let's say that five years ago you bought a car, and you've been paying, you've been budgeting $250 a month in your budget for that car payment for the last five years. And next month it's going to be paid off. If you do nothing, your budget for car payments will go to zero. But if between now and next month you go and you buy a second new car, your budget will not go to zero. It'll stay at $250 a month because you're now going to be making additional payments. That's all it's trying to say is that if you add things to your, if you add things to your budget, your budget won't go down as much as you might have anticipated if you didn't add them. So does that make more sense? Kind of. <laughs> okay. That would have to be done through a truth and taxation to add to the budget. I mean, either to raise the taxes, because well, we still have to raise, uh, wouldn't we? Appro approving the bond is buying the new car. Approving the city center is buying no, the new car. the second car. No, it's, I'm talking about the second car. Let's, the rec center is the first car. Okay, oh. Okay, the city center. Have, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but we still have to have the voters approve the second car. Right. Which is why we're here. Which is why we're here. Any more questions, comments? Thank you so much for coming. It, it really means a lot. That I appreciate your interest in the community and the questions, and we encourage you to vote in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much for coming.